just click record. I think we're good. Okay. To All right. So I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6.03. Chris is going to be our minute taker. Thank you, Chris. No problem. Um, I'm going to add three items to the agenda. The first item is uh, under the consent agenda. I'm going to add to authorize the board chair and superintendent to accept IDEA B grant funds. Um, under the executive limitations monitoring section, I'm going to add E, communication and support to the board regarding the website. And then after the executive session, add an action item to direct the board chair to execute a three year contract for the superintendent. Those are the additions to the meeting. At this time, is there any public comment? There is one caller, um, and I don't know that a caller can type into the chat box to let us know they want to speak. So do you mind if I allow the caller to talk and we can ask if they have anything to add? Sure. And we can find out if it's a board member trying to call in because they had some okay. issues. Hello? Hi, uh, this is Liz. Sorry, my Zoom wasn't working. Um, I'll, I'll try to get in through uh, when I'm home. I'm just in the car on the way, so I'll listen. And uh, thank you for getting me in. You're welcome. All right, thanks, Liz. Okay. All right, if there's no public comment, we'll move down to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? So move. Caleb, is that right? <laughs> okay. Yes, Caleb. Okay. Second, Sarah McLean. Okay. All right. All those in favor of accepting the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. All right. We'll move down to executive limitations to accept. Our, our first item is an action item to accept the monitoring report report for 2.3 financial condition inactivities. Is there someone willing to make that motion? So moved. Uh, who said that one? Krista. Sorry, it was very quiet. I couldn't tell where it came from. <laughs> it's Krista. Okay, thank you. Is there You're a welcome. Second? Liz Caleb, I second. Okay, thank you. All right, all, uh, any discussion? Kevin, I did get your, your worksheet and I'll include that with the signature form. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Doesn't look like anybody wants to say anything. All right, all those in favor of accepting the monitoring report for 2.3 financial condition activities, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The next was an update, the financial report in your packet. Anything you want to start us with, Patrick? Um. I guess just sort of big picture and, and Floyd can fill in any details that there, that folks may want, but big picture is we're projecting to finish this year out somewhere around 1.2 million um, in, in terms of a fund balance. And as we've discussed in prior meetings, the intent is to um, spend um, effectively all but 500,000 of that 1.2 million or, or, or whatever our fund balance ends up being, we're still working on some final details. So that keeps um, a $500,000 fund balance for the end of this year is the same that we use to, which basically has a neutral effect on building FY22, um, which we felt was really important. We don't wanna to add to the challenges that, that we may be facing in FY22 and we wanted to do as much of the planned projects this year as we could so that we have you know the funds in FY21 to handle whatever might get thrown our way from sort of COVID, clawback, whatever. There's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of how that's all gonna play out. So 
um, basically the plan is still moving ahead as we anticipated. Krista? Can you hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Sorry, I'm so close, but I want to make sure you can hear me. Um, can you remind us, Patrick, if we're one point whatever um, fund balance right now sounds high, but is that typically where we are, or did we under budget in some areas to have such a large amount at this stage? I would say it's a little, it's definitely higher than where we want to end um, in a typical year. And it's a little higher than where we have been the last few years. I think we had 900,000 um, maybe two years ago. And I think it was closer to 750 this past year. So we were kind of getting to a place where we were having a smaller fund balance, which I think is is really the ideal because that means we're, we're budgeting a little more closely to what we should be spending. Um, this year, there were some things that, so COVID for sure, you know, there were expenses that didn't happen from a transportation standpoint. There are expenses that didn't happen from spring athletics and activities. So there are a number of things that are unique to this COVID spring that impacted what that fund balance is. And that's why it was, I think that's largely attributable anyway to why it's higher than typical. Um, and part of that 1.2 million is knowing that we were holding some of the $1 million that we had for facilities to pay toward this locker room project that just hasn't been paid yet, but was planned to be paid all along. So when you take all of those things into consideration, we really are about where we want to be um, in terms of creating a, a, leaving a fund balance at the end of the year. Thank you. Floyd, feel free to add any, fill in any gaps that I'm leaving out. I, th I think that's it. That's perfect. One positive um, with uh, coming out of COVID and its impact on our, our fund balance is that we're not looking at any additional transfer of money to the lunch program. Um, because of the way it, we were able to bill it out, we're going to finish at pretty close to a break even for the first time in as far back as I can see um, on our numbers. So a, a big positive there, not a lot of money, but just a, a nice win and it's kind of celebrate them when we get them. But it's also, I think it was it 60,000 last year? Yeah. That, or 60,000 maybe that we had anticipated needing to contribute? It was, we, we had contributed 195 in the budget, added another 65 to make them whole, to make that program whole at the as we close out the year. And we've sort of already anticipated that next year, right? Right. Yeah. So it's, we're budgeted at two uh, off the top of my head, 260 next year, um, anticipating that trend of, um, of a gap continuing, um, but we got a little bit of a bonus this year with, um, with the ability to deliver food under, under that structure. Yeah, when food service doesn't have to pay for transportation and we're delivering meals at the <laughs> reimbursable rates, it's a good thing for food service. You might have said this before, but and I, I think it's the case that we can't use any of this balance next year's budget, but the year after. And so did you so, but you're going to spend down some um, on capital projects, was it, primarily? Yeah, and that's, we'll talk a little bit more about that on the facilities projects update. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what those projects are. Okay, thank you. Caleb? Um, when you kind of just think about the food service, um, I know some reimbursement was coming from the federal program, or I think it was for the, the um, reimbursement for the meals. But um, for some of the costs incurred uh, around transportation, um, 
would this, are you already taking into effect that some of that might be reimbursable from the state now through the CRF funds? Um, that's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, not really money that's out there yet, but it occurs to me that maybe even some of those costs are going to be reimbursable. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's, if that's in the calculation at all at this point. It's, it's not in that calculation at all. And, and really any, any reimbursement we might see for that transportation piece is going to feed into 22 because we're going to see a corresponding drop in our transportation funding because the, we won't be able to use what we spent this year on um, uh, budgeting for revenue in 22. It would be great to see some, some money covering that. I think it's a great way to backfill it um, from a legislative standpoint to, to protect not just our budget, but budgets across the state that delivered and paid, um, paid those, those fees for delivery and keeping the bus companies rolling. And that's something just sort of in general that I think we're still waiting for a little more clarity on in terms of any, any money that's coming to us for some COVID related expenses going to be money that we can actually sort of count on or is it going to be kind of a flow through um, that then, you know, is, is not given to us in terms of a payment from the Ed fund. Like there's still a lot of uncertainty around how exactly that's all going to work and what the, what the end result's going to be um, in terms of the bottom line. Yeah, I think that some clarity is coming with the Q1 budget, which should pass tomorrow and Oops. definitely by this week, because of course Q1 starts next week. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but I think that there's, anyway, I don't want to derail this portion, but I do think it could be good to have some update there because I think it looks pretty good in this, a couple different categories of reimbursement, um, both things that are clearly covered, um, including transportation for food and um, operating childcare facilities for essential workers, both of which our district did. But then I think there's also a desire to find some um, uh, hours in, within your budgets and labor that qualifies um, that was previously budgeted for, that was in the 2019, 2020 operating budgets, but that actually can be coded to, and there is another effort that would maybe send even more money to schools, and that's complicated because the goal there is in some ways to displace currently budgeted money and push that money forward to try to fill some of the revenue gap that's coming for FY21. And so it's kind of a bifurcated thing but it looks like for all the just qualified reimbursements, there should definitely be money enough to cover those before even getting into that secondary conversation, which is a little more, you know, complicated. That's actually great news. And, and we're in really good position, I think, to be able to be flexible. So mm -hmm. in, we get some of this money that's really cash in the bank that we can count on that means we'll we'll try to pay down more of some of the debt for these this project that's going to span multiple um budget cycles so thinking about more multiple fiscal years um and that positions us that much better next year to be able to utilize the funds that we have so i think we can we, we can adjust accordingly as we get clarity on what what's going to happen with these funds that are coming our way so that's good news I'm not seeing anybody else. Unless they just thought of a question. <laughs> okay, and we'll move on. The next is the update on the facilities projects. Yeah, so this is uh, just a, a brief update on some of the things that we're looking to do um, as we wrap up this year. And, and these are things that will expend um, some of that fund balance that'll bring it down closer to that 500,000 mark. Um, and really there are three, three big projects that, that are underway. There's a fourth that we wish we could do, but it doesn't seem like it's gonna be feasible in terms of availability of contractors over the summer. Uh, but I'll start with the three. 
So obviously the locker room project, that's the big one. And that's uh, actually making great progress. I don't know if I could say with, with uh, certainty that it's ahead of schedule, but it certainly seems like it could be. Um, I've been over a couple of times. I know Floyd's been over some. Um, I think they're done the, the destruction phase and they're beginning the construction phase. Um, it was pretty interesting to go in and see the, the locker rooms gutted and the big trench dug in the pool hallway to replace some of the drain pipes. And um, now they're, they're, they've poured cement and they're rebuilding. So that's exciting. There'll be some uh, great progress updates, I'm sure, when we come back together in August. Um, and it should be approaching completion at that point. I don't know if it'll be complete yet. But that's definitely obviously the big project. Um, two other smaller projects that I think are far less dollars, but will have significant impact. Uh, one is we are moving ahead with replacing the seating in the auditorium. I don't know when the last time is that you're sitting in there, but there are some, there are many broken chairs. There's a whole aisle that had to get removed because they were a safety hazard. And, and I think it's fair to say those seats have exceeded their life expectancy. So we're really excited for those to get replaced. And while those seats are pulled up, that's a great time to be replacing the carpet in the auditorium as well. So new carpeting and new uh, seating in the auditorium, which will have a great impact on that space and um, make it that much more enjoyable for both the faculty, staff, and students that use that on a somewhat regular basis, but obviously, of course, the public events that happen there. And I think more appropriately reflect the events that happen there and the work that happens in that space. It's, there's some amazing things that happen there and it's uh, time the space started catching up with um, reflecting those amazing things. And then the, the third big project that we're moving ahead with is um, sort of a, a facelift to the front entrance. So basically from the, from the curb to the front door, not a whole lot on the inside, um, is going to get kind of a makeover. A, it'll be great for some first impressions and um, I think we lost you, Patrick. Kind of, again, make the space reflect what happens inside that space. But I'll, all right, I see you guys all moving again. Does that mean I'm back? Yep, you just got back, but we missed the whole content of what, you, what was happening out front. Okay, let me start over with the front. So um, a major facelift. Um, so definitely some aesthetic and kind of functional things in terms of flow of people uh, to the front entrance. So doing some, some stonework, some paving, uh, not paving, but uh, cement work, some plantings, uh, some benches, things of that nature uh, to create a much more welcoming feel as you're approaching the building but also some accessibility improvements in terms of a proper curb cut at the sidewalk that crosses the, the road there leading up to the front entrance. And rather than you know, folks with, with accessibility challenges needing to walk down the paved sidewalk, kind of go over the little bump over to the door that they probably can't get in, and then back over to the main door to work, to work their way in, we are doing away with that little side door to the left um, we're moving all of that sort of communications aspect, the camera and the voice communication over to the main doors um, near where the handicapped accessible button is. So a, someone with mobility challenges can wheel up or whatever their mobility might be, push the button at the door, interact with whomever's there. And then once the doors are unlocked, hit the handicapped accessible door opener and get in. So. Um, a significant improvement in that regard as well. And so where that, where that little door is, the, the single door to the left where that currently is, that's gonna go back to being a window and it will match that, that whole uh, area as it was originally designed and built. So a lot of aesthetic, but also a lot of functionality um, to that project. And so that, so that project is about 100,000 and the seating and carpet work is about 125,000. And then we'll be putting the, the balance of what we can to the locker room project to pay that down um, to mean that less will need to come out of next year's um, million dollars. And the project that we were hopeful to do, but just at this point seems we wouldn't be able to line up the contractor is the duct cleaning at Mount Abe. If you remember a few years ago, we did um, the duct cleaning at all the elementary schools and 
people in those schools reported a noticeable difference. Um, and we had planned on doing the same at Mount A, but then the, there was a question about the HVAC, which is what prompted the HVAC group to do their work and conduct those studies. So that kind of stalled the cleaning because the idea was if the study suggested that the HVAC at Mount A needs to be replaced, then we probably don't need to spend a lot of money cleaning it before it gets torn out. So those studies happened and they, they came back saying that the, the system actually is in pretty good shape um, and we made a lot of improvements in how we operate it and maintain it. Um, but now it looks like we're gonna keep that system for a while, so we're back into the planning stages of doing the duct cleaning. We'd hope to have that done before school started, just in uh, relative to COVID and being able to, you know, get the air exchange to the best, et cetera. But availability of contractors, I think, is going to make it so we can't do that. So we're going to have to still do that work, but rethink a timeline for when it can happen. Perhaps over the course of next year, trying to take advantage of various breaks and things and, and kind of phase it in over time. Caleb? That certainly makes sense about the timeline. I did want, just since this is specific to HVAC, there is, um, uh, I've got another uh, participant here. Um, no offense, Caleb, but it's more fun listening right. to your other participant. Yeah, yeah, sure. she'll. <laughs> um, 6.5 million specifically for HVAC is coming in, in the budget uh, to be, run by efficiency vermont so yeah I, maybe it's impossible to get a contractor but maybe there's also going to be a more concerted effort to make that labor available because there is this um 6.5 million and money specified for that purpose so just um anyway let me think of it uh yeah. I, I put it in the chat box for anyone who hadn't seen that uh that's the bill and it's page 4629 um sorry it wasn't but i just for people's interest and actually, that reminds me that I, I just recently learned in, in talking with a, a senator on House Ed uh, about that, but also, perhaps more importantly, that Efficiency Vermont may be a resource to help track down a contractor to do that work. Um, I hadn't thought of them beforehand, so that, that's something that we can explore and, and maybe advance this timeline faster than we thought. But regardless, one way or another, that's something that needs to happen, and, and we'll try to get it done as soon as possible. But we were, when we were projecting this project out earlier, we, we anticipated a figure of somewhere in the 150,000 range to do the duct cleaning at Mount Abe. And I think that's it for the facilities projects update. Okay. All right. I don't see anybody's hands up, so we'll keep going. Um, the next is an update on the capital carry carryover account. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give just sort of the, the, the general overview of this and Floyd can add any details, but basically what a practice we started last year at this time was um, to create a capital carryover account. So for these projects that we, we know are big projects that will start as soon as school's out, and usually continue through the summer before school starts again, because they, they cross over or, or carry over two uh, fiscal years, we have to create an account that basically earmarks funds for this project that we had anticipated that won't be completed before the end of the fiscal year. Um, and so we're, we're preparing to, to take that same approach this year, most notably for the locker room project, but others uh, as well. So those other projects that I had talked about um, will be considered in that capital carryover account. Lloyd, I don't know if you want to add some details to that. It's really just an accounting practice, but it felt important to make the board aware of this accounting practice because it's still relatively new, but it makes pretty good fiscal sense. I, I think it captured it all. It's just a, a way for us to um, balance the two fiscal years as needed as well, not knowing where we're going to land directly on our, our ending balance. Um, this gives us some flexibility in that arena as well. And part of the other reason it's an agenda item is from an audit perspective. So Floyd's been talking with the auditors about this to make sure that we're doing this the proper way and, and, and all that. So when we're audited, it all you know, shows up fine. 
um, it was important to have a sort of paper trail that the board was aware of this accounting practice. And so having it in this agenda item, uh, in this agenda also um, provides that, that need as well. Like everybody's good we'll keep moving along the next is uh, communication and support to the board it was the item added at the beginning um, and Patrick wanted to talk sort of give us some information about the website yeah so I've been talking about this website for a little while and I didn't know if maybe you all wanted to actually see it because it's about ready to go live so I'll share my screen and give you a sneak peek at it. It's not quite live yet, but it's very, very close. Right. So here it is. So a home screen that actually has lots of pictures of kids and great things. Immediately, that's something that grabs your attention. Calendar was the other thing that we realized was a, was a significant reason why people go to websites. So we wanted to give that something more prominent. Um, we also recognize there was some accessibility challenges with our, with our current website. So on our new website, you can choose any of our schools from here, but you can also choose from many different languages to translate our website into. So I can't, I can't see anything on the screen sharing. Is, any, is everyone else having a problem with that? I can see. I can it. see. Hmm. I'm not having any trouble either. I will follow up from this presentation with an email to all of you with a link to this. Just know that it's it's not the live site. This is still sort of in the behind the scenes version. But that way you'll get a chance to see it, Kevin, and kind of poke around and let me know if you have any questions and uh, I'll answer those. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so all the drop downs are here. So a message from the superintendent. Uh, let me come back to the home. So all the same information and more that folks would have been able to find on the old website, but organized a little bit differently. This one I think is definitely better. It was really important as we were doing this that if somebody and obviously this is for, for the MAUSD, like central office folks, um, but even thinking about schools, like so if little Johnny comes home and says, oh, this nice lady named whatever came in and helped me with math today, oftentimes a, a parent may not know who that person is, but now with each school having this same kind of um, staff directory, they can see a face and a name and they can even learn a little bit about who that person is um, Kind of what they do in the district and even some personal things about them a little bit in a, this sort of short biography. So that felt like a really uh, significant benefit. This is also, <clears throat> this calendar is a link. So someone can come to this calendar and they can choose, these are all um, so district-wide events or, or all the significant events at each school, but you could customize your calendar to be whatever schools you want to show events from. <clears throat> so if I'm a parent that has a, a child at Bristol Elementary and Mount Abe, I could choose Bristol and Mount Abe as the two calendars that I wanna see events for. So from a user interface, that's definitely a benefit um, over what we currently offer. Patrick, and when you um, click on the year overview, with the, with, when you click on the year overview within the calendar, is that just gonna show you basically what we get on the magnets? Because I always find that very useful. Like up where it says June and it says year overview. Is there any way to see like the whole year? Let's see. <laughs> yes, I don't know what it's necessarily showing. Let me see if I can get back. There's a different place where the, so he, this is, so this is next year's calendar as you're, as you're thinking of that's linked in here. So that's the same as, as the magnets. The other, the year overview will show a lot more detailed events for each of the schools.
Oh, that's the next one we're going to go to. Um, all right, so it's kind of scrolling down, obviously, and I'll share the link and you can kind of play around with this, but a lot of different, um, different kinds of resources here. And hopefully working on some fillable forms like for facilities, rental forms and things of that nature. But we also have some quick links. So a little bit about us and who we are, beautiful picture of Mount Abe. Um, again, another link to our schools, another version of the calendar. This is a this is a direct feed from our Instagram account. So as pictures are posted to the Instagram, these will update and keep keep that fresh. Various news stories. You can see some of the some of the more recent news stories here. Again, just a sort of a little bit about who we are. Links to our social media, our district at a glance, then a featured video. So obviously we can keep these updated, um, but definitely a lot, a lot more organized, a lot more user friendly, a lot more um, kid oriented, which I think is a great thing. And I'll give you a sneak preview of what the schools will look like. So similar format. So this is Lincoln Community School. And you can see very similar format. So as people are navigating between different sites, it's gonna look very similar. So they can find the information they're looking for easily. Also important to know, so again, um, if, you're, if your child comes home and says, oh, I had a great time in art today, and somebody's thinking, I don't know who the art teacher is in Lincoln. Click on art, and there's a bio about Nancy, the art teacher at Lincoln. And you can kind of see the name, the face, learn about who they are, or any staff member at the school. So that's a very quick overview, but we're pretty excited about it. And it is possibly as early as the end of this week, we're gonna be able to go live or just a couple of things we're trying to polish up before we make it live. So, so whose job is it to update this really magnificent improvement of a website? So each school has two webmasters. Um, and it's the, the combination of the, so the two webmasters maybe don't do everything, but they're in charge of making sure everything happens. They'll do a lot and in some cases may do everything, um, but they'll be, they're the ones that will be on top of folks to get new pictures and kind of keep it fresh. And Jennifer is sort of my lead person for the district to make sure that the webmasters are getting everything done. So we have sort of a almost a chain of command, you know, I'll be going to Jennifer when I'm seeing things aren't staying updated. Um, and she'll be on top of that as well, to be working with folks in the school to provide whatever support might be needed, so that it doesn't become something that is stagnant, because I think that that doesn't reflect um, sort of what we want these websites to be, we want them to be dynamic and stay up to date and stay current. And that's why having some of these links. Um, you know, if I go back to the home page, having some of these links that are automatically updated, like the Instagram pictures and um, our social media presence, that's gonna always keep something fresh and new on the website. So to try, the more we can automate that, the, the more fresh and current it will stay. And obviously there are plenty of things that will require a lot more work to keep fresh and updated. That's awesome. I mean, I think a lot of that is what we've been we've been hoping for. So thank you. That's absolutely awesome. And uh, what I will do is work with Jennifer to um, put a board meeting highlight click on to under um, school board. Yep. That's awesome. Thank you. And yeah. any as you when I send the link as you are kind of playing around and checking things out. If you have any feedback. Again, knowing there may be some things that say coming soon or something like that, because we're still finishing a few things up. Um, please feel free to email Jennifer and copy me as you see something that could make the website better. Because even when we go live, there's going to be a lot that we learn from the feedback that we get that we can continue to make improvements with. So, so feel free to share it.
That looks great. Awesome. Yeah, it looks really good. Jennifer has put in a ton of work to make this happen. Every, I feel like every time I've talked to her the last couple of weeks, she's been working on the website and it shows it's, it's great. And it's been a long time coming, um, several, several months in the making, but I think it's going to be worth it in the end. I almost wonder if, um, some kids could intern on it and help like some really talented kids that are good at that kind of stuff, like students just as a suggestion. So that might be something to consider. We actually talked about, you know, some, some of the pictures that people take with their cell phones get pixelated, especially for the larger photos on the website. So we actually, we've talked about, you know, on some sort of semi-frequent basis, either hiring a professional photographer to have some high quality pictures to represent, again, the really good work that's happening, or um, tying into some, uh, I believe there's a photography class at Mount A that we could maybe see if that was a project that students might be interested in and, and, and still ending up with really high quality pictures. Because that's, it's unfortunate to have this beautiful website and then not have the kind of quality pictures that we want to reflect what's happening in our schools so prominent on this website. So we'll continue to figure that out. But that, the idea of involving students very much is something we've been talking about. anybody else has their hand up so we'll keep moving along thank you Patrick uh, board management and governance an action item to accept the monitoring report for 4.7 governance investment is there somebody going to make that motion Andrew I saw your you unmute but I didn't hear anything Can I make a motion to accept the monitoring report? Thank you, Sarah. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Rob, second. All right. All right. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of accepting the monitoring report 4.7 governance investment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Next is an update for the Community Engagement Committee. I think I'll let Krista go on that one. Sorry that I did not include the link to our, agenda, our minutes from our last meeting. I'm just sticking them in the chat now. Um, but essentially we are, um, still working on, on, um, this idea of a community school task force and our next meeting is next Tuesday and we'll hopefully finalize the invitation to, um, various people in the community that we think should be part of this conversation, um, and pick a date. And then I'll be working with Sue McCormick to draft an initial agenda and then sharing that with the committee. Um, we've had a lot of really good conversations about, you know, what our role is in this idea of this task force and um, what is the charge of the community engagement committee and why is this important to do right now at this time. Um, and how does that differ from an other engagement work we might do? Um, and I think we're, we're working through that, um, recognizing you know, that the impetus for, for our work is really facilitating communication throughout our community and um, bringing together different people across the five towns that um, might be facing similar issues or 
challenges that we're facing um, could only be helpful to us as we try to figure out how to move forward, especially given COVID and um, declining enrollment. And th those are things that impact so many different aspects of our community. Uh, the, and I think the task force, we've you know, recognized that that's a reaction also to the desire of our community to have um, our facilities plan incorporate looking at some really tangible things that um, a facilities consultants can look at, but also some bigger picture issues like how do we attract more people to our five towns um, that are things that would be outside the scope of a traditional consultant or of our board. So we're going to continue moving forward on that um, idea of convening this group, but really see our role as kind of convening an initial group and then letting it ideally form its own identity, focus, and goals, and that there would be no ownership or responsibility of the board other than um, encouraging, as long as it seems valuable, our, our administration to have a voice at that table. Um, so once we get that off the ground, and I hope by, the, by our next meeting, we will be ready to, to move on from that task force forming, we're going to be um, talking about community engagement for the fall, both budget related and facilities planning related. And those are going to also be pretty important conversations to have. We hope to have um, a way to organize our thoughts at the board retreat um, because it's going to take all of the board members to be involved in how do we want to you know, let folks know about what our budget challenges are looking like and the facility, uh, the work of the consultant on the facilities end and figure out where we want to engage and get input from our community. So that's kind of what we've been working on, but there are a couple of board members who are on that committee who might want to add something if they have anything to add or I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about that. So if I could, I want to just take a little time here to talk about the board meeting highlight stuff, which is part of the um, sort of of the of this somewhat, um, just how we're going to present stuff to the community, um, including board meeting updates. But but if anyone had anything to talk about about what you were talking about, go right ahead for sure. I'm not seeing anyone else, so. So, so I did look at the, um, the board communication structure process best practices um, sheet that we, you guys did a while ago before I was on the board. And um, part of the reason I didn't do the board communication last month is I wasn't sure what information we wanted to give about the contracts that were um, settled and um, so I wanted to ask this group that to some degree. Um, the rest of it was somewhat self-evident and I just wanted to also get one person from each town who will be the disseminator of information, who would agree to be the disseminator of information each time so that every month I don't have to sort of say, hey, who will do this from um, whatever town. Um, so again, um, when contracts used to be settled, people wanted to know how long is the contract, how much money is it for, and what are the major changes, if any. So I didn't know if people wanted me to just give links to the contracts, which is a little bit onerous, people have to look through it, or um, maybe the people who are on those, um, the committees for each, uh, for professional and support staff could just do a little synopsis to put into the communication um because i and, and and i mean i really i mean people in the community used to be really really interested in that stuff i didn't get a sense of it this time that that was uh, happening as much as it has in the past Don, you might agree but um but i didn't know exactly what we wanted to sugar it down to and put in that communication so um Maybe Sarah and I could do it for our group, and maybe Don and Steve could do it for their group. You know, just a, a bullet points, but um, I think that people do like to know that. 
information and and i think looking through the contract is even i get dizzy trying to do that so um would that be something that would be okay if we did that and then we could get that out by certainly a week from now i think i think is that okay all right so sarah maybe you and i can have a quick conversation or we could work on it an email about it or something okay um because i think that's important information but it's important that it's accurately put put out there um and what i thought we could also do at the end of our meeting is maybe um put just five minutes um i mean there's stuff that like people will be really interested in what's going on in the building that's exciting you know people are that's the kind of stuff people want to know about and then some of it we just i just refer to the minutes right some of it people don't need to hear about it's it's self-explanatory in the minutes um and let's see um so if at the end anyone has something that they want to make sure gets into the board meeting highlights maybe we could just take a minute to say hey um does anyone have something they definitely want to get in there um, and again, some of it is self-evident as we go along anyway, or I could at the end say, here's what I was thinking of putting in, you know, it doesn't need to be, a, oh, my cat's coming over. It doesn't have to be a huge discussion, but um, I want to make sure that the stuff that gets in there is what, what the board members want to have in there. Um, but I think that the new website will help quite a bit in, in communicating. And I love that calendar on the front. That's sort of what we've been asking for. That's exactly it. And that's what a lot of community members are asking for is how do I, um, I don't think that my cat can knock the laptop off, but she's trying. Um, hey, come here, buddy. No, oh, go down there. Oh. Um, that, that's what a lot of people have asked for is just really clear communication, but I'll still put that in the board meeting highlights and I'll make sure that that's a clickable thing on the under the board um, piece there. And then people can can go to that. It will be posted, and it will be posted to a link instead of a PDF kind of thing. And I think that's much better. I think that um, um, Rob had talked about that that it would be better to have it be a link than than a PDF. So, um, so that's just. Does anyone else have any input for what should be in, should be in that? And then I could also link to for this time to the um the piece about the the big video that that everybody did i could just put a link to that in there too um so kristen it might be um useful if you were going to um want to get feedback on items you're going to put in the thing to maybe send out a quick draft of it first oh that's a good idea yeah. before yeah. public you know because sometimes we get this thing and you say can you put this up and then i'm reading it and i'm like hmm it's the first time I've seen it, right. but then it's going to get posted. I think we have to be careful about emails that send out information and getting in the habit of commenting only in email. Um, Krista. Well, I was wondering if um, I like your, well, first, I'm glad you brought this up, Kristen. And thanks for trying to get us more organized about this. And I like the idea of, you know, either at the end of the meeting or maybe you know, within a few days of the meeting, if there's, especially if you're like chairing or involved in something outside of, or, or that you wanna make sure it gets adequate coverage, whether it's the facilities group or, or whatever else is happening, um, that you give people a couple of days and then you just put forth what you're gonna put forth. Um, but I did wonder if, you know, it'd be great to know, you know, we adopted this and we don't, I don't think have a real formal way to evaluate how well it's been working and what tweaks we might want to make. And so I didn't know if it needs to be part of how we evaluate ourselves as a board, just so that we make sure every, you know, every so often we, we say, is this process working? Because it was designed to to be better about regularly communicating out in a consistent way. Um, but, but as Kristen's been doing it for some time, we might learn that there's things we could do a little differently, so. Chris, Kristen, I think your idea of maybe five minutes at the end, if, if throughout the meeting you're just jotting down the topics and then if you run it by everybody and people can, you know, 
a thumbs up or something. I think that's a great way to start rather than you waiting for us to give your feedback. If you just jot down the main ideas and Sarah has, McLean has, Sarah McLean has her hand up. Yeah, this is just um, regarding uh, community engagement in general more so. Um, do we know how many people viewed the video that, that you created or that we created? Do we have any? No. And then also, when we have, I've had everyone that I run into anywhere at the river is asking, you know, are our kids going to have to wear masks? You know, everyone is really focused on that. And I don't, I don't have any, any response. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, when we'll know more and how we'll um, share that information or when we'll share information just that we don't even know like what the next steps are as, as far as reaching out to the community with that, those kind of um, thoughts and plans for the future. So that, that's the million dollar question that's asked routinely, when are we going to know more? That's, <laughs> we have that same question. Uh, we did get some guidance recently and, and just today I sort of launched a planning structure to, to both do, like, do the work of planning for the fall based on the guidance that has come out and will continue to evolve as, as we work through the summer toward the fall. But one of those teams is a communications team and Krista is on that team, um, you know, representing the work of the board and the communication, the community engagement aspect of that. Um, and I wanted to have a team specifically about communication so that it can be the primary focus and it can be done well and we can keep people up to date. So because it just got launched today, that team will, will be working to create a meeting schedule and then they'll be meeting following our steering committee uh, meetings where we'll be making decisions that can then be reported out and, and that'll happen with some frequency, but I don't know what yet. Um, over the course of the summer as we approach the fall. Patrick, what's that called exactly? I could put that in the meeting minutes saying that that's, a, what's, what did you call that again? Let me make sure I get the title right. Let me find okay. it. I'll... That's fine, but thank you. Uh, th that will be reassuring to people that, you know, I mean, that's ongoing and you'll get information to people as soon as um, it's thorough and, and possible to do that. Krista? You sent that email out today, didn't you? Krista, did you have something to say? Yeah, I was just going to share. I don't know if it was from every building principal, Patrick, but um, from Bristol, we got, well, it must not have been because I only got it from Bristol and not from Mount Abe, but perhaps other building principals might send something similar. Um, just this great note from Tom Buzzle um, at BES, just kind of, here's a link to the guidance we got here's what we're going to do to grapple with this. You might want to try to digest it now. You might want to wait until we know what that will look like specifically for our schools, but either way, I'm here to talk kind of thing. It was so perfect. Um, the tone was awesome. And, but that, that guidance from the state is there available to people and it's worth it's daunting and it has says in a million different places that it'll be edited in an ongoing way, but it does provide some, you know, at least some general answers to questions people have. Yeah, so I think each principal is doing something. I think it's not, it's definitely not as con a consistent message as what Tom sent out to everybody, but I do think different principals over the course of, of time have been sending out uh, communications in addition to what have been coming out from a district level perspective. Um, and I'm sure that will continue to happen throughout the summer and as we, as we approach and go through the fall as well. Um, you know, just building principals wanting to have that relationship with their communities um, in addition to what's happening from a district level. And uh, Kristen, that is the uh, COVID-19 response plan is, is what we're developing. And I, I wonder, Kristen, if we could also add that state produced document that Tom Buzzle referenced in his Bristol note, you know, for folks to, if they want to take a peek at the 25 pages of recommendations. 
Yeah, I have a copy of that, so I can. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad idea because it sounds like maybe not everybody in every town knows that's been put out yet. You mean not everybody sleeps with it under their pillow at night, like somebody <laughs> here? I, it, yeah, that must be a great way to get some good sleep, Katrina. I am feeling for you. I shared that with my parents just to say, like, this is the world we live in. And they were like, God bless your administrators. So from my parents to you. <laughs> so that document's linked to the AOE website. So it could be just a link to that site. So as things continue to evolve, that may be a good way to keep everybody fresh. Yeah, Patrick, uh, to piggyback off that, I was just thinking, you know, we have what will be public, uh, new public website. Um, if there's any way you could have, you know, a banner across the top that says, you know, COVID updates that you can click on and it drives you to the link from the state, or if you have an update or if building principals have updates. So as a board member, like Sarah, I can say, you know, I, I don't have the answer, um, but hey, check out our new website. And also while you're there, you can find the most current information that uh, that we have as a school district. Just a thought. Jennifer and I actually talked about that exact thing today um, in thinking about where's the appropriate placement for some of the COVID announcements and things that have come out so far, just trying to keep um, all of those present so people can reflect back or, or use them for whatever they might be useful for. Um, and we agree that it needs a, a pretty prominent place on the website. Um, because that will be, for the next several months, that will be the number one thing people want to know more about and they'll be going to our websites to try and find it. So we need to make that very easy to find. And what, one thing I might add, Krista, from our meeting is that um, the Community Engagement Committee recognizes that there's a lot going on. And some of us were a bit hesitant to take on this task force thing right now, but it, it, I mean, it is, it could um, be helpful because everyone's dealing with COVID-19, but it did feel like a bit of a lift. But as, as Krista said, we're going to try to hand it back to the people that the, uh, in the community um, to, to keep it moving. Um, so anyways, there's so much going on. It's, it's quite remarkable. And perhaps to answer your specific question, Sarah, so you can have a response next time you're at the river. Um, as the, the current guidance does say that everyone is expected to wear masks um, unless there's some, you know, condition that makes it um, impractical for them to do so. So if they have some sort of medical condition that wearing a mask would complicate, then that would be an exemption from having to wear the mask. But as a general rule, everyone is expected to wear masks based on the guidance that just came out, which may change over the summer. I think that's the other caveat to make sure that we're adding as we're explaining to people, um, you know, the guidance that came out is helpful and it gives us something to work from and it could change. And I would just add that, you know, our ELP summer program is going to be a great program to watch in terms of how we are essentially piloting um, a program that is larger than two of our current elementary school populations. Um, and I will say that we aren't requiring students to wear masks, although they will be provided, but we are highly encouraging and, but we, we aren't going to force kids to wear them. Sarah McLean, did you have something else to say? I do again, regarding community engagement. I know like since all of the riots have been um, all over the country with since George Floyd's death, that Patrick, you did send on an email to the community. And I'm just wondering what our responsibility is on the website or, or to, like to, um, to continue the conversation of, of how we as a district are going to address systemic racism, whether it's uh, via curriculum, um, you know, just, yeah. So I, I'm curious of, of how we're going to address that, I guess. I'm happy to speak to a couple of things that I know that are happening this summer. Um, there are some uh, humanities teachers at Mount Abraham who are getting together to do an analysis of their current syllabi and uh, curriculum maps to see what they have, what needs to be revamped, and looking at most recent um, information that's come forward, and they're going to be proposing some changes to some of the curricula at Mount Abraham.
Chris, Krista. I think um, someone might have emailed, maybe it was you, Rob, who emailed me about this question, but uh, might we consider a board statement? I think we did that once before around school shootings, if I recall. Um, sure. yeah. But uh, thank you, if it was you, Rob, for bringing that up. But I think that's that's something that we might consider as well. Was there another hand? I thought I saw a hand and now I'm everything, everybody moved. <laughs> Kevin. Um, if I, I don't wanna disrupt this topic, but I do wanna go back to some mechanics with the fact that we set up a, um, if, so I guess I should ask, are we, is that topic done or is there, some continuing conversation. The topic of the community engagement, is that what you mean? Uh, no, the, the topic of uh, systemic racism. Oh. I don't want to interrupt it because I, I've got a different thing I want to talk about. It looks like Rob had, I think, Rob, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I couldn't figure out how to unmute. Um, yeah, Krista, that was me. and. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think it would be a personally appropriate uh, if the board, we did come out with, with a formalized statement. Um, and it's, in my opinion, not too late uh, by any means. So that, I, I don't know how we'd go about that process being new, but uh, I, I think it would be uh, uh, wise. So usually someone rough something out during the meeting and then we talk about it later. <laughs> and see if we can agree to put something out. So if you want to, does anyone want to work on that while we're in the meeting or? Or sometimes someone comes to the meeting with ideas already written down um, and then um, we can sort of polish it or whatever. Um, the Moncton board used to do that a lot. So um, usually, yeah. So if someone wants to work on that. The other thing we could do is, you know, sort of delegate somebody to work on it with and work with somebody else. And then, um, then what, you know, the two people can sort of run it by me because that's the way our policy is. And then it, it could go out. I'll volunteer to work on it. Do, do you want somebody to bounce ideas off of? There's somebody willing. Well, I would love help. I, I can help with it. Okay, so if, if you two want to give it a shot and then, you know, send it over and we'll sort of, the three of us look at it and then we can get something out. Okay, sounds good. Usually what we would do at meetings in Moncton is actually vote on it to send it out. And I, I don't know if that's more powerful, but um, we probably might not have time to do that unless someone really jams right now, but, um, we, we would always sort of um, vote to put it out, but we could vote ahead of time to put it out or something. I don't know, maybe we don't have to, but. Looks like, all right. Well, we can also, you know, reaffirm it after the fact. And we can put it out and then at our next board meeting, we can reaffirm this, the statement. And that puts it in the record of our board meeting. You all moved again. Okay. Krista. I'm comfortable with it going out and then affirming it after, you know, whatever makes it easiest to do. <laughs> Right. At this point, because we don't have a July meeting, it's the, probably the best way to get it out is to work on it and then um, sort of review it and then reaffirm it afterward. Okay. All right. Okay. Dave, did you have your hand up? 
Oh, you're still muted. Yes, I, I, I uh, did have my hand up with regard to racism and systemic racism. Um, you know, I, I noticed in the uh, survey that went out recently, I asked uh, about um, disaggregation of the, of the data with regard to race. Uh, you know, it's very hard for us as a board to determine whether uh, we have systemic racism if the data we get doesn't, uh, doesn't indicate uh, differences with regard to race. So um, I would appreciate uh, in terms of board activity going forward that, um, you know, in, in, in trying to bring an end to um, systemic racism in our schools that we uh, have data that we collect, whether it's in survey form or otherwise, uh, disaggregated by race. Probably worth just noting that we, we can collect data that way, but in all likelihood, we wouldn't be able to report out data that way in a public way because our end size is so small, it becomes identifiable. That's, that's been the challenge with uh, disaggregating by a number of different subgroups, race being one of them. Um, but other subgroups, the end size is, is quite small as well when it's exclusively in the USD data that we're looking at. Krista? I would argue that we should just assume we have systemic racism um, and operate from that premise because you know, there's so many examples, even just in the way we teach our curriculum and what we do and don't teach, um, that it would be really, I mean, that's, I guess, easier to measure, but there are, it's just so widespread and in such a white state that I think um, data can be useful, but I think what we're going to do to move forward and educate people is probably of greater importance. Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving along because we do have a 7.30 deadline. So, um, Kevin, you had a comment about mechanics you wanted to talk about. Where did you go? Yeah, so there was a, there's a procedure that was approved by the board a, a while ago, maybe a year ago or so, that set in place the communication aspects and which actually Kristen has taken on a lot of that as, as some part of that, but I, I'm not clear as to what level that document is at and is, would it, and, and should it be given the fact that communications are so important an A level procedure that gets uh, a monitor, a monitor uh, is monitored on an annual basis. Yeah, that's what I was asking about earlier. I think it, it should be regularly monitored in some way. Just sort of yeah. how you make that happen. So I, I, I guess I, I don't know. If, so if, it must not be an A level document or something. Otherwise, it would be part of the monitoring procedures. I can, I'm guessing. Right. We monitor Wait. policy and procedures. We don't monitor. Oh, so if yeah. you want to monitor something, you have to turn it into a policy to monitor it. But it may fit with one of the policies we have already as a piece of evidence. And then through that process could be something that would be discussed further. And, um, and I think that's in a way that's, I think, useful and something that should happen. And that might be a little different than I think what Krista might have been talking about in terms of perhaps a more frequent than annual review of that. So if it's if it falls under a review because of the monitoring report and it's an evidence in the monitoring report, that's likely an annual review. But I got the sense from Krista that maybe more frequent than annual was desired. So, and it doesn't mean that it has to be exclusive of the other. It could be, it could be part of your your monthly board check, right? So your your yes. um, that assessment that happens and still be evidence in a monitoring report that happens in more depth annually. How do we make that happen? 
which part? The part about adding it to the board evaluation or the part about? Um, Sounds like we need to elevate aspects of the policy to be a procedure and were included in a procedure to get to that level of monitoring? No, we need to get it into policy more into policy but as patrick said there may be a place within the policy if we look at it to see if it already would fit and then use then maybe and maybe that means the interpretation has to sort of grab that that explanation of it and then it would be in in a monitoring report that it's explained in the interpretation and then documented in the evidence. And it could be a board monitoring report, but we should probably look to the policy first to see if it's already covered there. And then if we have to work on our interpretation to fit, to add that in or, and then it becomes part of the documentation in the, in the data. Something along the lines of ownership linkage is coming to mind like that. Yeah. It fits under that umbrella. Um, you just have to look through the, the board policies and see. It's 4.2 board job description, the linkage between the ownership and the operational organization. So well, actually the link between the owner, the, right. the link between, repeat that again, Don. It's the, so accordingly, the board has direct responsibility to create the link, linkage between the ownership and the operational organization. Right. So we have the board meetings and the board meeting minutes. That's sort of our official um, broadcast to the world of what we've been doing. So this highlights thing is it's a little more casual. It's a little, it can sort of be a little more informal, but it, in essence, it's a little bit of a duplication of the, of the minutes. And in that sense, that's why I was just suggesting it might make some sense to have a draft go out so people can agree on it. The timing of that is all the question. Um, if, if the information wants to go out super quick, then it's not really possible to like put it out and then have it be a board action at the say the beginning of the minute the meeting you say hey um do we approve last month's minutes and do we approve the highlights draft that went out that, that accompanies it because they're really discussing the same thing um but then the board would not only approve the the minutes they'd approve the highlights that went out and were posted on the website and um front porch forum or wherever else. Um, if it's just going to be at five minutes at the end of the meeting um, that we sort of agree on what topics Kristen is going to cover, does that, is that enough to cover our, you know, our duty to review what we're putting out as public policy or public conversation? Krista? I'm wondering, so we have our committee, community engagement committee charge. We could elaborate that to say that we will, we will operate, we will utilize this communication structure and we will evaluate it quarterly. And then it becomes the responsible of the committee to bring that to the board. And then when we look at our policy of linkage to the owners, that's our evidence is we have this policy and that the committee reviews it quarterly or whatever, you know, I just wonder, I wonder if the, Community Engagement Committee can can talk about how best to ensure there's fidelity with this process, whether, you know, however it unfolds. Um, and then we, you know, report back to the board on how how it's going and if tweaks need to be made. made. And does that seem the most effective way? So it's, it'll, it's captured in policy, but we need to also embed a a way to look at actually the nitty gritty of the structure. And that, that seems like something the committee could do as part of their charge. I wonder if though, if any of our board, our governance 
our board governance policies talk about how our committees work and if we have to have any kind of regular, like how do we monitor what committees are doing? <laughs> anyway. Well, we, we do have the com board committee structure. Right. So, so if, um, you know, if in, if in there we're asking committees to kind of, you know, this committee is a great example. It's come up regularly where we have to revisit what is our charge? What are we doing? Is this in the scope of the of the work of the board? Um, you know, and then we've come up with this procedure. You know, it seems like we are doing some of that kind of ad hoc, but it's not necessarily required of us by any any board policy, I don't think. Somebody else had their hand up and I don't know who it was. Dave has his hand up on the uh, participants list. I can't, I can't, see I don't see it here. Dave, did you have your hand up? No, I don't have my hand up. Okay. Unless if you're talking about Dave Sharp, I don't know another Dave on the committee. But um, well, if you go down to the participants list, there's a a list of people. Oh, I see it there. Then Dave's hand is raised there. Okay. Maybe not intentionally. Maybe not. All right. Hey. Could you give us guidance, Don, at the next meeting on how to proceed from a policy governance standpoint? Like, here's how I think we could make sure we monitor it, and then, and then yeah. we'll just make. Okay. Yep. I'll look into it. How's that? Okay. Then, um, just to keep us moving along. Um, um, the next. Uh, item is to bo board retreat topics and specifically as Patrick and I were trying to prepare we we w both wanted to be sure we understood what the group wanted when they mentioned e ends and core values so what we're hoping to get a little clarity around what is it you want to talk about around the end so that we can plan for um, maybe having Susan from Brown Dog Consulting help with the discussion or just to be sure we know what it is you're looking for in that ends topic. Don, before we do that, did you skip items C and D? Sorry, yes, I did. Before we get to that, you're right. My apologies. Um, update from Kevin, maybe, Fac uh, Facilities Feasibility Study Subcommittee. Okay, we met um, early in June, and uh, we did a uh, Zoom with John Kennedy from NESDEC. Um, he kind of went over what um, the process will entail. Looks like they'll start doing some uh, demographics research soon if they haven't already started it seen it um and then there was quite a bit of discussion about how they anticipate being able to go into schools or else or um, understand what's going on in schools given the fact that buildings are empty they may not look like a normal or what what they look like before covid in the fall um so um, there was a little bit up in the air as to what, what and when they would actually be doing the physical inspection of the schools, if you will. The community members, as we talked through schedule of, with NESEC, were concerned about the timing of it. They um, um, are thinking that um, we're packing a lot. There's a lot being packed into a short amount of time or there could be some delays if if um, we wait for the optimal things to go but Patrick and his administration assured them that you know they're comfortable with the way things are going uh, the community also uh, discussed the communication 
impact tool that uh, Sue McCormick had uh, made up and thought it was a good tool to use as we evaluate um, issues and, and items. There was a little discussion as to if it was all inclusive or if it uh, made a lot of sense for everything we did. And the, the takeaway was pretty much that we would use it as, as written up by Sue. And if we had to tweak it given a situation, we would just informally do that. Um, our next meeting is July 6 at 3 p.m. on Zoom. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Okay, and then Kevin, you're probably going to give us the legislative update. Maybe Caleb's going to chime in. But. Okay, from a VSBA point of view, you know, again, uh, we met June 10th, so it's a little bit of some some of it's old news by now. But um, there was a motion passed by the VSBA requesting that the legislator act on de determining a plan. There's a bill S-46 in the Senate at the time that was um, to implement the wait waiting study. And there's a couple people from Wyndham that had written up a resolution um, to uh, kind of force, have the VSBA force that issue a little bit um, this biennium, the language, after discussion, the language was changed from adopting it, this biennium was to um, recommend or, or pitch a, some sort of a plan of adoption. Um, interesting by the Chittenden Grand Isle people. So there's obviously when you're talking through this representatives through the state come, there's the different perspectives. Wyndham being um, somebody that perceive they will win, I don't know if win, win's the nasty word, win and lose on this, but would be advantageous for them. So they're very anxious and Chittenden County, obviously not so much for the most part. Um, the member engagement committees put out a survey this week, last week. Um, so everybody should have gotten that with a little video. Encourage everybody to fill it out. It takes 10 minutes or so. Watch the video because uh, one of your local uh, reps on the Addison Regional Board uh, was was uh, showcased on it. Um, so with the opening of schools planned this fall, the VSBAs moved their annual conference to July timeframe. And the theme is going to be uh, on topics of reopening or how it appears the um, schools will reopen. So it's going to be a conference to support the reopening of schools in the fall. Um, it's going to be all online. Um, there's a little bit of discussion about fees in the past. It's been a physical location with guest speakers and whatnot. And this time around with Zoom meetings, it's not anticipated um, that the costs will be there. So there, the fee structure will be rather nominal for this year, but the intent was to move up um, the, the conference part of the annual meeting to this summer to help deal with and, and add a resource for the reopening of schools in the fall. The business meeting will remain sometime in the fall and that will be announced later. Um, South Burlington, um, made a request and uh, we, actually the board deliberated with them um, with a recent bond issue that they did for their school up there. Um, they had a citizen contest, contest um, the dissemination of information, if, they, if you will. And there's a couple of different state statutes that um, they brought to the AG's office. One, um, and I can't remember the numbers, but one is basically allow school boards, towns to provide information to voters to educate them, if you will, to inform them about a particular vote. So South Burlington had put out some plan pamphlets, taken out ads for their bond vote. Um, the appellant was not happy and, and um, or alleged that they should have also filled out campaign financing paperwork with the Secretary of State's office. So 
Um, basically, if you spend more than thousand dollars campaigning, you need to disclose that to the Secretary of State's office, which means if if um, and so the AG's office told South Burlington that they need to fill out the proper the appropriate paperwork for cam campaign financing. So they came to the VSBA and um, pitched pitched what the dilemma was and asked for support. And the VA, VSBA did a, make a motion and it was approved to support them to uh, challenge the Attorney General's office as to the need to fill out campaign finance documentation to the Secretary of State. It has fairly far reaching effects. It not only affects schools, it could affect towns um, as well. Anybody that's gonna be disseminating information from municipality to um, inform voters to on what they need to be voted on. So um, that that's out there as well. I think that's most of it. There, I did send out highlights. I assume everybody got them with a few other details, but those are the major highlights, major points. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, now we'll go back to the board retreat topics and oops, specifically, Sarah. Um, yeah, just be specifically uh, speaking to the board retreat topic of the ends. Um, I am interested in just revisiting the ends, what we want to see in the ends and the metrics we use in order um, to get there. So we've traditionally waited a lot from what I can what the ends reports that I've seen on the SBAC, um, we don't have that this year. And so this is an opportunity to, to see what other metrics are out there that we can use. We had talked last year about um, surveys and we have definitely discussed other metrics that we can use to point to whether or not we're in compliance and meeting the ends. Um, so yeah, I think it's just to have a more general conversation of what we wanna see in the ends. Like for instance, we have um, an equity goal as part of our ends. Um, so, but I don't know who's in charge of implementing that goal and the, the process that that's taking. And so I think just to have a little bit of a deeper dive into the ends policies and how we measure whether or not we're, we're meeting those ends. So it sounds to me, Don, um, and I think I recall a conversation from last time as well, that it's not so much that we want to redefine the ends. It sounds more like a um, discussion of the evidence. Is that fair to say? That's, I'm just trying to understand what everybody was thinking when we when we all agreed that the end was a topic so I want to hear from everybody and Krista yeah I'll just add to that I remember I think it maybe was our last meeting that Katrina asked that question of us as well what would you like to see um, and I know that well I don't know I'm but I think we see the ENDS report in November, October, November, but I'm, I'm sure it gets worked on, you know, at least a month or so before then. So the retreat seems like a good time. And um, I think last year we were supposed to have had the chance to, to look at what was going to be presented to, or to talk about what we wanted to see before the report was put together, but then, then we didn't, something happened and we didn't get that chance. And so, you know, if our work is truly to focus on the ends, but we don't, we're just reacting to a document and then offering lots of feedback for next time, that doesn't sound that future focus. Um, so it seems important to, to spend more time looking at how that evidence is presented. And we have the strategic plan now, which is a great place to start um, as well and kind of fleshing out what we might hope to see for those different goals. Could, 
Katrina? I, mean, I, have a, I have a couple of just clarifying thoughts. The difference between an ENDS monitoring report and a strategic plan update, those seem like two different yet obviously connected things. So they're, yeah, so that's one thing to think about. And then my other thought is that, yes, we, we put together the report for you, we package it for you to read in October, but remember the data is all happening that whole entire year before. So if there's something different, it, it almost needs to be decided, for example, this summer at the retreat for not the October report, but the next report, because the year's gone by now. And especially this year, where we are going to have not as much of the standardized test, well, no, standardized test data. I have thoughts about what kind of local assessment data I can provide. I also know that last October, that monitoring report, we provided disaggregated data that we hadn't provided in the past, mostly around SBAC as it related to the subgroups. We could do that again, potentially, with some of our local assessment data. But again, because we didn't have the last three, three and a half months of school, it won't necessarily tell you the story that you're looking for, at least not not as clearly right now. So those are two things to think about. The, the years gone by, so the data that we go get is what it is. If there's something that we should be thinking about differently ahead of time so that I can make sure that teachers know we're collecting something different than what is already being put in something, I need more time to do that. And consider the difference between the ENDS monitoring report and a strategic plan update. Those are my two thoughts. I guess as I'm thinking about the strategic plan <clears throat> and sort of its role and where it fits in in sort of process, you know, when the what led up to the creation of the strategic plan was sort of a reaffirmation on the board's part of the ends and a, a creation of a vision and mission. So sort of procedurally, the board establishes vision, mission, ends which basically then gives me my directive. The strategic plan is sort of my, my map that I, I hold responsibility for that we created obviously through a very collaborative process that is our roadmap to achieving or at least um, making progress toward achievement of the ends over the next five years. And so as I've seen it, that strategic plan is a document that we lean on pretty heavily um, going forward, which we, this, this was year one of the strategic plan implementation, even though it's something we've been talking about for four years, this was the, the first year, a quarter of which and significant um, assessment pieces are going to be missing from. So it's an unfortunate start to this uh, strategic plan reflection process. Um, but we had anticipated already some changes to the ENDS monitoring report to reflect the work that was happening around the strategic plan. And as more as the strategic plan becomes more and more fully implemented, the ENDS monitoring report would continue to reflect the new assessments that are measuring what we say are important in our strategic plan. So I just want to keep that sort of process in mind as well as we work, work forward with this. I'm after after hearing from a few members, I'm also feeling like this is more about what you want to see in the ENDS monitoring report. And I'm not sure that's the best way for us to approach the ENDS as board members. So maybe some general connection back to our process and how we look at the ENDS and and would would be the place for us to start. Krista? Sorry, I see Dave's hand up also, and I've been talking a lot, so feel free to have him go first. Okay, Dave? Um, yeah, so this ends discussion is very important. I'm particularly focused, as I mentioned in a previous board meeting, um, you know, of, of the equity of uh, our students at, um, at grade three, because it's so predictive of um, the success of our students through their school K through 12 career and actually beyond their K through 12 career. 
So um, I'd like to have that be part of the discussion. I was very concerned in this. Data is difficult to come by and relying uh, extensively on SBAC, I think has its drawbacks. Um, I was very um, disappointed when I inquired about the survey that went out that there was no disaggregation in the data with regard to income level because um, that speaks directly to uh, equity, as does race. Um, and uh, I, I don't know how we get at that discussion if uh, we can't see the data. Um, but I think those are important factors. Are, are we, uh, do we have an equitable education system, which I think the state in general does not. And um, I think that that's a, a goal I have anyway, and I would hope our district has. I guess I would also say, I think the process you referred to, Dawn, is, is uh, important as well. How, how we approach um, figuring out the ends. Krista, did you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to hear a little more about what you were saying, Don, about your concern that we're that we're um, not looking at the ends in the right way, or how, I don't know how you said it, but I, just, I want to hear more about what your concerns are. Um, it just seems like it's going back to the data you want to see, and I don't know that I have it formed in my head how to say it, but it seems like the more about how it's happening than, than looking at the ends as in that bigger picture. I'm well, it's our, I mean, like I don't, I'm not necessarily certain that the, our description of the ends, if you read our ends, that anybody has a particular issue with our aspirations, but we are required to somehow judge by evidence in the monitoring of that report, uh, whether or not we're actually getting there or not. So I think what people were trying to figure out is what's convincing enough to be good evidence um, that we're actually making good progress towards our aspirations. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong about that process. Maybe another way to think about it is, so clearly there's something missing, at least in the minds of some or several people on the board. And the question that I have, and this is the, the clarity I'm trying to, to seek so I can be helpful in, in fulfilling what seems to be. So it's either there's something absent from the policy that is creating this sort of um, gap between where we are and where we want to be. But there's something with the interpretation or there's something with the evidence. And I, I can't quite figure out if it's policy, interpretation, or evidence that is missing something or maybe a, some combination of the three. I think anything else, we get into means and that gets a little trickier. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I think we're we're trying to have the conversation that we're planning to have at the retreat right now, which is, I mean, I think we need to look open the open the document up and look at it and talk about it. Okay, I think I'm kind of feeling like if I can talk with Susan and Patrick, I think. I sort of have an idea where you're going. Sarah McLean. Yeah, just one thing that I that I don't want to um, have dominate so much of our time at the board retreat is specifically going through policy governance. Um, I feel like that that conversation we do have that and we, re we revisit and there's always so much more that we can learn for how we actually govern this board and you know, I'm, I'm definitely still in the thick of learning it. And I also think that in focusing on the ends, which is our, 
I, the way I've looked at it is kind of our work that through looking at the ends and how we get there, that policy governance will become clear and our role will become clear as we dig deeper into the ends. And the pol I think, Patrick, you're right. It's all three of those points that, that we want to touch upon and just understand more of. And then also what potentials are there for the data that is used to interpret the policy or, you know, um, and the ends in general. Well, the other piece that I'm thinking is part, part the reason the policy governance and the ends came up is we're, I think everyone's working on the board accelerator and it was a good way to sort of touch on that and use that what you discovered from that work to connect with the ends. Has everybody had a chance to at least look at the accelerator yet? seeing some yeses and some no's. Yeah, I've done uh, three or four of those chapters already. But I think part of what I was hoping to get out of the conversation from tonight was, that, you know, I, I feel some responsibility for planning to support the board at, at the retreat around this topic. And I, I'm hoping for something more than, so let's talk about ants, because I, I don't know where that's going to take us. I don't know. I need more information from this board as a whole to direct me in how to support you in this conversation at the retreat. And, and maybe it is simply wide open, let's talk about ends, but know that we wouldn't necessarily have a lot prepared to support that because there's many, many different directions we could go in with that conversation. So just looking for some guidance and clarity so that I can make sure that myself and my team are doing what we can to support you at the retreat. Sarah McLean. Yeah, well, if I specifically something that I'm really interested in is the data that is gathered to, to you know, the, the SBAC and all the different uh, data that we use, that you use um, to report on, on the ends. And I would like to um, investigate other options that we may have as a district and um, specifically now because we don't have SBAC. And I, I, Katrina, I hear what you're saying. Like we don't have, like anything we do now is not going to affect the October report, but just kind of thinking forward of, of other ways that we can, can measure the progress or lack thereof of, of the work that we're doing. Dave? So that's the big question, isn't it? You know, how do we know we're doing a good job educating our children? And, you know, the, 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 we have SAT and ACT and SBAC and, and uh, grade point average and the number of kids that go to college and all these, all these data points. Um, you know, and, and all of them are flawed. And, and I think that uh, we really don't know. Um, and I'd like to know maybe what this administration thinks ought to be the parameters that are brought forward to, to determine whether we're uh, doing a good job educating our children. Uh, and then as a board, we should talk about whether those seem like appropriate parameters to us. And then we, we should, get those parameters and uh, find out if we're making progress on an annual basis. Um, so I think those are the really tough questions and um, we don't have really good answers for those. Katrina? I would point to the, the strategic plan and the ENDS monitor report as the documents that our efforts to provide that kind of information. So we, we, we went through an extensive <clears throat> multi-year process to identify what do we want our students to know and be able to do. And we are, we've articulated that in the strategic plan based on the interpretation of the ends and the ends themselves. And inclusive in that strategic plan are metrics for measuring these things that we say are identifiers of doing a good job educating our kids. Um, 
and we will continue to evolve the ENDS monitoring report to reflect those metrics, some of which aren't created and we will need to create um, that are reflected in the strategic plan. So it's, yeah, I just wanna to continue to come back to that strategic plan because I think it, it's easy to create new processes and new documents and new, new things that are running parallel to work that's already happening. And I just wanna be more cohesive than uh, duplicative. Krista. So, so that was somewhat what I was going to say, but I wanted to add just a, another piece to Dave's point, And that is that it becomes really challenging when everybody's interpretation of a good job is different. So when the board can come to consensus about a target that is going to be indicative in their minds as what a good job looks like, it makes our job a little bit easier so that we can, you know, pare down the kind of data that we're able to either create as Patrick described or provide to help you arrive at that determination. But I've been doing this in this district now for 11 years and good job seems to take on a very different meaning in these conversations than all the documents that we've made so pretty that have now become my life. So I think that's something that we need to think about. Krista. Yeah, I was just reflecting back on our steering committee meetings for the strategic plan. And, um, you know, I wonder if it would be really helpful for the board to revisit some of the behind the, the, the nuts and bolts there because there were lots of really good and smarter than me in this work people that thought about all the different ways to measure this. This board doesn't know that though. And I don't think this board necessarily wants to reinvent those things or come up with them ourselves, but we'd like to know more about it. Um, so we can have more confidence that, you know, it's headed in the direction that warrants, you know, approval of the ends or that we feel good about that we're going to get to those improvements that we want to see. Um, and I think, you know, for me specifically, I know uh, that you know, in some of the follow-up to the to the steering committee for the strategic plan, that other group that I was part of, the SPOIT or the SWAT or the SPEAT or the whatever it was, you know, we, we I, I, it is a huge lift for the district to achieve all of those goals. Um, but there's a concern about like equity, for example, you know, I asked the question at one of those meetings, like who will, you know, Katrina is, pretty well maxed out leading the charge for the expertise and learning piece. So who is going to take the equity piece? And, and there really wasn't a great answer at that time. So that, you know, so it'd be good for the board to know, like, these are our structural challenges. These are the assessments and things we hope to achieve, but, you know, we don't, you know, here's what's missing and in the framework to make it happen, or here's how we're going to do this or whatever it is so that, you know, I think we just need to know a little bit more about that, not to tell you what to do, but to know that, that it's, because it really has been well thought out by lots of good folks. Steve. So, I mean, Patrick, I don't, that sounds to me like an agenda. Um, I think you almost voiced it yourself. Um, maybe just, defining a little bit of the, the linkage between where you see those metrics coming out of your strategic plan and how they're going to, um, you know, um, enhance what's currently in the ENDS monitoring report. And the only other thing I wanted to throw out there was I know, for instance, there was some discussion about the, you know, the local data and how it hadn't been um, regularized between all the schools. Like it was sort of being done before we were a, uh, a combined district was all kind of being done in different ways. And how do you pull those things together to make a real district wide measurement of, of local data. So that may be part of the strategic plan work as well. And, you know, how is that coming along and an update on that sort of information. So. Yeah, that was that was my takeaway as as, as Krista was talking as the conversations been evolving starting to feel like a conversation about the strategic plan and, and some of the, the thinking that went behind that, but also how it connects to the ends and the interpretation of the ends and the kind of, of 
because to me the strategic plan articulates what we want our students to know and be able to do and identifies metrics on how we're going to measure that so i feel like that that conversation and how it encompasses the the ends and the interpretation of the ends um, and how it influences the monitoring report for the ends feels like that ties together pretty much everything that i've heard um, and it, it ties it together in a way that's connected to the plan we have in place that we're currently working which feels um, you know like there's some continuity to that so yeah that's i was picking up on the same thing steve Kevin? At the uh, review of the ends last year, I really got the impression that we were data diving instead of looking at uh, conclusions. And I think, you know, it, it sounds like it's important to review what we're going to use for a basis through data, but we don't want to get too hung up on that. Um, and we need to also keep in mind that everybody hates SBAC, but that's a, that's, a, that's a data point that is almost universal. Um, and we need to not only make it a gauge on how we're doing it as a district, but we need to remember that we're being looked at comparative to other districts. And that aspect is, I'm not sure that aspect's in there as well. You know, how, how, how are we viewed or how do we get viewed and what data is is externally forced on us through uh, let's say Zillow or you know uh, whatever educational consolidation websites there are out there for people choosing different districts and stuff so we should and I may be getting into a detail here but there's there's this whole thing about not only what we're looking to do internally, but what is being externally looked into us from that seems so it should be covered or considered. Caleb. Thanks, Don. Um, yeah, I, uh, one thing I just wanted to mention is um, what I, one thing I, I've certainly said a number of times before, I think there's some, sometimes there could be an opportunity for, and I don't know if this is allowable actually, but for a new policy, if we think that a new policy is needed to speak to a need, which is um, evident in our community or through our community engagement work. And, <clears throat> you know, or maybe, you know, for some, for some policies, the type of evidence that we're using and the type of um, reporting we're getting is completely appropriate. And it might be that for some other policies, you know, I think of using the budget as evidence. You know, I, I kind of think of ends um, policies as being value statements and a, and a budget as being a kind of value statement. And I think sometimes it would be a good opportunity through our policy to build greater comprehension of our budget. And so that's another type of evidence that I think could be used by, um, by Patrick and, and you know, uh, staff and future uh, superintendents to provide that data. Because sometimes, um, especially when we've got an end that's aspirational, we are, it is forward looking. We know we're not necessarily gonna achieve that end in one year or five years, but looking at the structure of what we're funding and what we're, you know, deeming, you know, right for, um, reasonable for taxpayers to pay like that. That's just, I think sometimes kind of illuminating. Um, so as I said, I think this board should feel comfortable to change policies where they need to, but also just to know that it, it's not, it's not all, it's not all the same. Not all policy is created equal and it can't all be judged the same way according to the same exact same types of evidence. Um, and if we're not too wooden about that expectation, I think it's a workable system. I kind of feel like given what Patrick's the connections you made between what some of the board members that do you feel like we're in a good place with some direction Patrick. If 
what I articulated is something everybody can live with, then I feel like we're good on direction. If that's way off base, then that would be important to know. I saw a thumbs up. <laughs> How are people feeling? Oh, okay. Andrew's got a thumb up. Caleb's got it. Sarah LaPearl, Sarah McLean, Liz, Dave, Dave. Okay. I think, I think that's okay. Great. Great. All right. Okay. So the next piece we have to do is executive session. So did everybody get the link to, to go to the ex executive session zoom meeting? So we'll, we'll need to take care of a couple things before we leave this. So, um, I think Patrick, you're going to be waiting in this meeting for us to come back. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, um, so Chris, if you'll just get us into executive session, I can fill in the remaining amount uh, of stuff on the, uh, on the uh, minutes. So you, you won't have to. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so everyone will, finish here. We'll leave this meeting, go to the other Zoom meeting where board council will join us. So um, I need, um, we're going to need an executive session under Title I, DSA 5313A3. It's time to turn the lights on. Um, evaluation of an employee. We, we do not need to determine premature knowledge on that one. I remember correctly. Um, and this is specifically around the superintendent's employment contract. So if we can have a motion to go in the executive session and know that we will meet board council there. So moved. Krista. Right. Krista. Steve second. Steve Rooney second. All right, all those in favor of going into executive session under Title I BSA 5313A3. Evaluation of an employee, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so we'll leave this and I'll see you in the other one. And Susan Floyd and Katrina, I don't think there's any need to stick around until afterwards. So I'll see you all tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, we're recording. Okay, so we came out of executive session at 834. And right now we'll take care of that action item that um, I need a motion to direct the board chair to execute a three year contract for the superintendent under the terms and conditions as presented. So moved, Andrew. Did we lose Dave? I'm looking. Yeah, he's not in the attendees list. And he's not up as a panelist right now. I thought he was in the executive session. He was twice I let him in. Okay, so I have a motion from Andrew. Is there a second? Second. Steve? All right, any further discussion? Seeing heads going now. So all those in favor of directing the board chair to execute a three-year contract for the superintendent under the terms and conditions as presented, please say aye. 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 Got aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Is there any public comment at this time? Again, Patrick, I got to rely on you. Do you see anyone? Yeah, there's, there's no one in the attendees, so just the 12 panelists that are on the screen right now. Okay. All right, does somebody, sorry, I'm going <coughs> to, excuse me, <laughs> does anyone have the board evaluation, the meeting evaluation handy that they could run us through us for us? I can right. do it, Don. I just oh. pulled it up. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so what is the level of engagement of all board members? A great deal, a lot, a moderate amount, a little, none at all. Okay. 
a lot. I don't know what the difference between a lot and a great deal is, but. I, I think those answers changed. I feel like that those are different answers than we usually get. <laughs> I agree. Somebody's gotten contemporary. Yeah. <laughs> It's got the heading on here and everything, so. All right, we'll have to look back into um, that. Somebody okay. had an evaluation. I don't see everybody, Don. So can you tell me if it looks like folks prefer a lot over a great deal or a moderate amount? <laughs> so if you like a lot, put uh, your thumb up. All right, if you like a lot, put your thumb up. One, two, three, four, five, six, uh -huh. seven, eight. No. Okay. Yep. We're going we're going with that. Okay. Was you the like agenda, that a great deal? <laughs> you like that a great deal, or just yes. a little? Um, was the agenda followed? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Does Here comes Dave. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, does the chair effectively establish the agenda and materials for distribution to the board? Yes or no? Yes. In head yes. nodding. Is the chair effective in fostering a professional culture regarding fair and open deliberation, full participation of all members, and ensuring the integrity of the board process? Yes or no? Yeah. yeah. Yep, thumbs, thumbs, thumbs. Other feedback for the chair? Hearing none. <laughs> uh, what went well with the meeting? Well, uh, we have a superintendent for the next three years. Hoorah. <laughs> Yay. I think that's me. I'm giving a thumbs up. So. Yeah. <laughs> you can vote on that. Big thumbs up to that. Um, OK, and any suggestions for ways to improve future meetings? Well, Krista was going to give us the five minute um, highlight reel. Right. And she's gone. She's gone. She had to go. <laughs> we'll have to figure that one out on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Okay. Is that, was that the last question? That's it. All right. So I'll take a motion to adjourn at 841. So moved. Krista. Andrew. I second, Andrew. All right. All those in favor of adjourning at 841, please say aye. 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 No, aye. Thumbs up there on that. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Stay Good cool. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Patrick. My pleasure. Um, hey, Don, do you have two seconds? Yeah. We have a few things that. Uh,